Good morning, friends. Good morning. Isn't it good to be uh, in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Sometimes I think back on where I could have been, other places I have been that weren't in church, and I'm thankful that I'm here. Amen. We made it. Amen. Look at somebody and smile. You made it. Amen. Uh, I'm going to kind of go over here uh, what we've been doing for the last few weeks. Uh, Basically, we've been driving through uh, Scripture and uh, through the Bible, and we went through the Old Testament, Genesis to Psalms, and and today we're going to begin our first topic in the New Testament, which is the birth of Christ. Amen? All right, so I like telling stories. Um, I'm pretty serious when I preach, but I'm also kind of goofy. So um, if you're not used to goofy, just, you know, let it go and, and, and just smile at me and be nice. Amen. So uh, last year, uh, when I called my parents to wish them a happy new year, my dad answered the phone and I said, hey, dad, what's your new year's resolution? And he said to make your mother as happy as I can all year. He uh, kind of said it a little bit, you know, happy and proudly. And so then mom got on the phone and I said, mom, what's your uh, resolution? She said to see that your dad keeps his New Year's resolution. (laughs) I like smiling in church. I like laughing in church. I don't, you know, I think there's a time and a season for everything. But I do like to have fun. Uh, I do like to smile and uh, I love God. Amen. The title of the message this morning is the word became flesh and uh with that, I'm going to go ahead and read the, uh, the verse that we read earlier, and um, that is John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's a lot to be said right there, to be full of grace and truth. Um, you know, I've heard it said before that if you're, if you're full of truth, but no love, it's a lie. You know, because that's what the enemy does. The enemy likes to tell you what you did, but doesn't give you the love to change. He doesn't give you the room to repent. He just tells you what you did and makes you feel condemned and puts it on your shoulders. But Jesus was full of grace and truth. The grace and and what that word grace means is the ability to change. And so, you know, God is so full. If if you ever feel like that there's something, you know, you messed up, you did this, you did that. Let me assure you that is not from God. Okay. God does not talk to us that way, and God is always, anytime he corrects us, it's with grace and truth, and there's always a freedom. It's kind of like, okay, let me explain. How many of you have a parent? (laughs) Probably everyone, right? Okay. Wait a minute. I saw some hands not go up. I'm kind of worried. How many of you have a grandparent? Okay. So, now, when my mom and dad would tell me what I did wrong... It was one thing, right? You, I can't believe you did this, blah, blah. And trust me, I had that conversation a lot, okay? But when your grandmother, anybody have a sweet grandmother, a loving grandmother, she didn't tell you what you did. It was more of the feeling that she had that she was disappointed is what she was projecting. And all of a sudden you felt horrible. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's the difference between the enemy and God. Okay, the enemy is like your parents. (laughs) And God is like your grandparents, right? Because God tells you, you know, you can be better. I, you know, I know you can do more. I know you can be better. And, and, And that's the way God is. He encourages, he empowers you to be different. It's not just telling you what you did, but it empowers you to change. So. You know, that's the way God is, okay? So let's start off. I want to uh, share something with you here real quick. Uh, In the early 19th century, okay, a war-weary world was anxiously watching the march of Napoleon. Now, Napoleon is on a rampage. He is trying to conquer the whole world. And, And the whole world is watching. I mean, not watching like we would today, but they're getting newspapers, you know, written things. And they're anxiously watching, like, what is going to happen? This guy's not stopping. And all the while that this is happening, babies were being born. I thought that was my mic or something popping. I thought, oh, no. Um, But all the while, babies were being born. 
In 1809, between the battles of Trafalgar and Waterloo, four-time British Prime Minister William E. Gladstone was born in Liverpool. That same year, poet Alfred Lord Tennyson was born in Somersby, England. Author Oliver Wendell Holmes was born in Boston. And composer Felix Mendelssohn was born in Hamburg, Germany. Also in 1809... A young man was born in Hedgenville, Kentucky, by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Now, in 1809, we're in the middle of the conquest of Napoleon, and people's minds were occupied with battles, not babies. Yet, almost two centuries later, is there any doubt about the greater contribution to history, the battles or the babies? The babies. And the same is true with the birth of Jesus. The Bethlehem crowds had no inkling that the Son of God was asleep in their little town. Only a few shepherds came to see him. And they left glorifying God. At the same time that Jesus is being born, uh, you know, the. There, there's babies being killed and there's a census being taken and all these things are going on. Israel's being conquered and, and, and all these things are happening. And in this town, the son of God is born. And very few people even knew it. We're going to go ahead and look at our first verse. It's in Luke chapter two. Four through seven. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Have you ever had a baby? I mean, you know, it's it's, you know, it's a rough thing, Right. And I, I just think it's ironic that they word it this way. It was her time to be delivered. You know, that, that's probably the way it feels. It's like, you know, you know what I mean? Like being delivered. You're being set free. It's like, whew, you know, my time is to be delivered. This, this, I'm got, I have heard this so many times. I want this thing out of me. I want it out of me, you know. And that's the funny thing about birthing and pregnancy. It's uncomfortable, painful. Makes you irritated, makes your ankle swell. No. You can't sleep, you can't lay on your stomach, you can't lay on your back, you can't lay on your side, everything hurts. It's a miserable, horrible, ugly thing to happen. When we're not even talking about the birthing. We're just talking about the pregnancy. Right? So it's 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 a a, a hard Thing. It's a difficult thing. But her time had come to finally be delivered. And she brought forth, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, the entire series here is concerning Route 66. And fortunately for me, I actually drove Route 66. Uh, I was able to drive from Phoenix Actually, I drove so much that I didn't want to drive after I got back for like a month. And but we, we arrived in Phoenix and I drove to Flagstaff and we got to Flagstaff. We decided to drive to the Grand Canyon. Then we decided to drive somewhere else. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm saying, let's go down Route 66. And we're driving down Route 66 because we're going to go see the Hoover Dam. And then we ended up in Las Vegas. And I drove so much. It was ridiculous. I'm sure Enterprise was shocked. When I brought the car back, you know, because it was unlimited miles. So I remember when I was traveling down Route 66 from Arizona to Nevada that the thought occurred to me that what I was seeing was probably the ugliest place I had ever seen in my life. It was dry and barren and rocky land. It was horrid. And yet at the same time, it was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. It's kind of strange. It's ugly, but beautiful. And I would go back and forth in my mind with it, like, wow, my gosh, this is ugly. I would never want to live here. And then a few moments later, I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. I mean, I'm colorblind and I was seeing some colors. It's kind of funny that a barren place would have so much color, but 
It was ugly and beautiful. It was very barren, yet very beautiful. So what if I told you that you had won an all expenses paid vacation? And if we can go to photo one, this is an all expenses paid vacation. And here's the land that you're going to go to. I mean, I'm sorry, but I know you're probably more intelligent than I am, but I'm thinking I'm about to see the Roadrunner and Wally Coyote go running by in an Acme Anvil fall. But because that's what that's what it looked like. It, it was just nothing. And if you're told, hey, you're going to win this all expenses paid vacation and this is where you're going to stay, you're probably going to be like, what? Uh, you know, I'm not too excited about that. We can go to photo two. But what if the, uh, another photo was given to you and that's what you saw? See, now all of a sudden, it takes on a different feeling. Now all of a sudden, you see a bigger picture of what's going on. And you say, wow, that does have some beauty to it. Maybe that wouldn't be so bad. It, it kind of changes things. It, it, it makes things a little bit different. Now, those two photos were stock photos from the Internet. This next photo that I want to show you was a photo that I personally took in 2009. And when I saw the sky, I had to pull over and take a picture. The clouds, I, you know, I don't know what it does for you. But when I saw this, I was so taken aback by it that I had to pull over and take a picture. To me, it was one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen. The way the clouds just seemed to be brushstroked on canvas. Almost like, to me, it was like I was seeing a glass tabletop over my head and there were feathers laying on it. I just wanted to stay there and stare at it. A matter of fact, I made it my, my uh, desktop uh, picture on my computer for a couple of years. Because I just thought it was so beautiful. It looked like it had just been stroked on with, with a paintbrush like Bob Ross. Anybody remember Bob Ross? Remember the fro guy and he would do the, the paintings and he would irritate me so bad because he would have this beautiful painting and then he'd be like, and now we're just going to take this and he would take this black line and just right up the middle and you're like, what are you doing? It looked perfect like that. And then he would just kind of make it into something, you know, and I always thought it was interesting. I didn't know this till a few years ago. I'd watched him several times just because, you know, oh, we're going to build a little oh, a happy tree and it's like, oh my gosh, is this guy real? And but did you know he was a drill instructor in the military? Yeah, <laughs> amazing. I just, you know, but after he got out, he said, I'm, I'm never going to yell again or something like that. And that's what he became. Kind of strange, right? So, but just looking, at, I had to pause and stop and look at it. Uh, you know, the, the clouds, and they weren't moving. The clouds were not moving. It was just like they were just there. Like they were put there on purpose, like, it was strange. And so I just wanted to sit there and look at it. Now, at the same time, if you look down, you can see the rocky desert land beneath it. Sometimes things can be ugly and beautiful at the same time. Most of you, when you saw this picture, your eyes were probably drawn to the clouds. But beneath it is a very ugly landscape. That really probably is not good for just about anything. And sometimes it's the ugly things that make the beautiful things possible. In a childbirth, it's one of the uglier things you'll ever see. But that baby is one of the more beautiful things you ever see. The reason that that land is rocky and barren is because of those clouds. Those clouds will not release rain. As beautiful as they are, they won't release rain. And so sometimes it's the ugly things that make the beautiful things possible. What this picture is to you depends on whether you're looking down or looking up. Being a pastor, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm a pastor... I've, I've been uh, licensed since 1999. Um, I began, I did children's church for two years. I love kids. Kids tend to love me. I, I don't know if that's because I'm closer in height to them than you are. 
But I did children's church for two years. And then uh, I got licensed in 1999. I did young adults, which is between 18 and 30. I did that for five years. And, and that was in Fort Meade, Maryland. Children's church and young adults in Fort Meade, Maryland. And then I went on and became a senior pastor in Cumberland, Maryland for 10, 10 or 11 years. And I had an abrupt change in my life. Resigned from my church. I didn't do anything wrong, but I resigned from my church and I came here. And I've been sitting for a year, just waiting to see what God's going to do. And been attending here for a year, in case you haven't seen me or know me. And um, so, um, I was brought here by my beautiful wife, Elizabeth. And um, she has uh, been a true, true blessing to me. Um, in my vocation as being a pastor, I get to meet a lot of people. And not only meet them, but I get to hear all their junk, okay? And I, I want to tell you, Elizabeth is, quite honestly, the, the best person I've ever met in my life. And uh, she is very, very unique, and I love her very much. So, sorry if you didn't want to hear that, but oh well. So... Sometimes the ugliest times can bring about the most beautiful times. And so was the place where Jesus was born and the manger that he laid in. I mean, you know, being born in, an, in, in a stable and, and being laid in a manger, a manger is a, a feeding trough. And, and they were ugly, yet it was the most beautiful thing the earth had ever seen. Think of that. This is the most beautiful thing the earth has ever seen. Seen. Forget the garden. Jesus' birth is the most beautiful thing the earth has ever seen at that point. And yet it's in a stable and he's laid in a manger. Our second verse, if you want to go ahead and put that up for me, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God loves to turn the ugly into beautiful. Isaiah 61 says that he gives us beauty for ashes. He loves to turn the ugly things around into something beautiful. If you're going through an ugly time right now, rest assured, God loves to turn that thing around. In my vocation, I get to meet, I've gotten to meet a lot of people. And I would see some people, they would be so distraught. And so they were going through such a hard time. Have you ever had this happen to you where you're talking to someone, especially a younger person, and they're developing and, and they're growing as a person and, and they're having such a hard time and they're so discouraged and they're so distraught and they're hurting. They're, they're, you know, they're struggling in their walk with God and they're trying so hard and they feel so defeated. And that's what they're going through. But when you look at them, you see, wow, you are really growing. I see so much potential in you. I see the character being built in you. And for you, this is an encouraging thing because you see hope for them. But for them, all they can see is the giant in front of them. All they can see is the darkness that they're in. But for us, when we're looking at them, we see that they're growing. We're seeing that it's good. And so if you're going through a hard time right now, please understand that myself and, and God and other people around you see that you're changing for the good. You're becoming a better person. He is turning your ashes to beauty. He is turning your ugly into something beautiful. It just depends on whether you're looking down or looking up. I'm going to tell you one more story if I can. If you'll let me. If you won't let me, I'm going to anyway. Unless they turn my mic off. There's, <laughs> there's a story told of a king in Africa. Who had a close friend that he grew up with. The friend had a habit of looking at every situation that ever occurred in his life. Positive or negative, And remarking this is good. How many of you have a friend like that that's just so positive all the time that you want to slap them? Anybody have a friend like that? Aren't they irritating? You know what I mean? It's like oh I just chopped my foot off but it's going to be okay. I'm like what are you talking? You know, you know everybody has one of those friends. It's just so bubbly and happy and you just want to like. You know, I don't know. 
yeah. So, but, you know, whether it was positive or negative, he'd be like, this is good. Okay. And so one day the king and his friend were out on a hunting expedition and the friend would load and prepare the guns for the king. The friend had apparently done something wrong in preparing one of the guns. For after taking the gun from his friend, the king fired it and his thumb was blown off. Examining the situation, the the friend remarked, as usual, this is good. To which the king replied, no, this is not good. And proceeded to send his friend to jail. About a year later, the king was hunting in an area that he should have known to stay clear of. Because cannibals had captured him and took him to their village. They tied his hands, stacked some wood, set up a stake and bound him to it. As they came near to set the fire to the wood, they noticed that the king was missing a thumb. Being superstitious, they never ate anyone who was less than whole. So untying the king, they sent him on his way. As he returned home, he was reminded of the event that had taken his thumb and felt remorse for the treatment of his friend. So he immediately went to the jail to speak with his friend. You were right, he said. It was good that my thumb was blown off. And he proceeded to tell the friend all that had just happened. And so I am very sorry for sending you to jail for so long. It was bad for me to do this. No, his friend replied. This is good. What do you mean this is good? How could it be good that I sent my friend to jail for a year? If I had not been in jail, I would have been with you. Thumbs and all. This is good. Brethren, count it all joy when you enter into various trials and situations. It is good. It is good. No matter what you're going through, it is good. God's going to work all things together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. If you're serving God and you're trying to worship him and you're trying to live for him, it is going to work out for your good. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Now, during creation. Genesis 2 says that God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life. Now, I want to pause and and, and look at that for just a second. So God touched the earth. God literally came everything else prior to this animals, plants, sky, water, the earth itself, everything God had spoken. But when it came to you and I. God chose to touch the earth. Everything else, he just spoke it. But when it came to us, he said, I want to touch this. I, this is going to, you know, I, I'm going to come up close and personal. And so God decides he's going to touch the earth. And then after creation, God rested. Anytime God touches the earth, things happen. And, and my point behind bringing that up is that all these other great things happen, but he just spoke. But when God takes the time out to come in and touch the earth, there's going to be ripple effects that last for eternity. God had to touch it for himself. I want to share something with you that happened this past week. Now, this is not a funny story. Um, This is a real story. Um, But this past week, our CEO came into town. I mean, you know, there's only two reasons for the CEO of the company to come into town. It's either good or bad. (laughs) Yes. Don't make me turn this car around. You know what I mean? So, So our CEO came into town and our numbers were down. We were doing everything in our power to turn those numbers around. We explained, we had already explained why the numbers were down and how it was due to some things that we couldn't fix. We had just relocated to a new location, a larger location, and and, and there were some things going on that we couldn't fix. And so with a one day notice, we found out that the CEO was coming to town. 
I mean, that was a bad day. That was a nervous day for most of the managers and supervisors. Because everybody's like, uh-oh, the CEO's coming. Are we getting fired? Right? Because we already know our numbers are down. So with one day notice, we find out he's coming. He came, he saw for himself that it was due to some things that were out of our control. He backed us and assured us that no one was getting fired. He authorized financing to resolve some contracting issues that we were facing, bought us lunch, and advised us as a group. Now, the advice that he gave that day, we already knew. But knowing that the CEO came, agreed, and empowered us to change the situation, ignited passion in the whole team. There comes a point when the CEO says, I've got to see what's going on in Pittsburgh myself. I can't conference call. I can't send emails back and forth. My feet have to touch down on the soil and my eyes have to see firsthand. When the CEO comes to that type of realization, you know that it's serious. So when God decides to touch the earth, please know it is serious. He's coming firsthand. So in creation, we find God comes down firsthand. He's touching the earth. The same is true when Jesus is born. God literally touches the earth again. The birth of Christ is just that monumental. This was once again God touching the earth. He didn't send an angel this time. He didn't send plagues. He didn't send anything. Well, he sent his son, but he chose at this point, this time, no more emails, no more conference calls, no more, no more uh, plague emails and no angel conference calls. I'm coming down there myself. I'm going to touch the earth myself and I'm going to do something. What I want to dive in here in this last portion here is who God is, because that's really what we're boiling all these down to. When we look at the birth of Jesus, we want to find out in that birth who God is, what God does and how it matters to me. Jesus left heaven to save his children. Now, we can stop and just look at the fact that he was born. And, and we can gloss over that. But have you ever taken a moment to think about all that Jesus gave up for us when he came to earth? We can just gloss over and look at the fact that he touched the earth. But let's go back a few pages and let's take a look at what he gave up. Imagine the glories of heaven. Golden streets, pearly gates, angelic music. Christ gave it up, all of it, for us. If it had been you, would you have left heaven to save some ungrateful, unloving, treacherous people? And yet that's what Christ did. He left the glories of heaven, set aside his own glory, set aside his own throne, and he came to, be, to earth to be born in a dark Foul smelling stable. What a contrast and rude awakening that must have been for the Christ. The king's first earthly bed was a feeding trough that still had the residue of cow saliva. What humility. What love. Jesus gave up everything for us. He came to give his life. That is who our God is. Our God came to give up his life. Other gods will ask you to give up your life. But our God came, left everything, touched the earth and said, not only am I here, but I'm going to give up myself for you. That's who our God is. 
Jesus had come to this earth not to be served as the greatest king, although he deserved it. No, Jesus came to serve. He came to bring us back to himself. We had run away from him and we were lost. Now it was time for him to bring us back. He wasn't afraid to touch the ugly parts of earth either. Not only did he not come to a mansion, but he wasn't afraid to touch the ugly parts like a manger or a cross. Although he was a baby, just a baby, soon Jesus would grow up and would die on that cross and pay for the sins of everyone on earth. The creator of the world, the one who owned the riches of heaven, gave up everything for us because he loved us. Jesus not only died for us, he lived for us. Jesus gave up everything so that we could have it all. In Jesus' own words, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come to fire us. He came to empower us and advise us to do what is right. That's what our God does. Our God doesn't sit there and, and become an egotistical uh, uh, entity that that wants to just tell us what to do so that we are scurrying around and, and doing everything he wants. Our God comes and leads by example. Our God comes and says, I'm going to do what you can't do. And I'm going to show you the way because I am the way I am the truth and I am the life. That's what our God does. He came that we might have life and life more abundantly. He came to give us victory. He came to heal us. He came to set us free. He came to show us what love really is. Growing up, my father had left me. And I was estranged from my father's side of the family my whole life. Growing up, I never received a birthday card from my father, never received a Christmas card, never received a, a present of any kind from my father. He knew where I was. He talked to my brothers and sisters who were much older than me. But there were five of them, and then 13 years went by, and all of a sudden, this accident happened. I'm an accident waiting to happen. Ask my wife. But there were five of them. And then 13 years goes by. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere. You know, you got to realize. That, you know, for them, I'm sure it was kind of shocking. Uh, my dad was 40 when I was born. So they had five in a row. Like, literally, some of them were only like 10 months apart. Like, it was like bang, 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 you know. And then 13 years goes by. And then here I am. And my father and my mother split up, and, and I guess, you know, he just, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. But he left and had nothing to do with me. So I was estranged from him and estranged from his entire side of the family. My father's mother, my grandmother, was a good Christian woman. Just such a good Christian woman. I, I remember going to see my grandmother. One of her things was you couldn't say the word but. Okay? Not, you know, the but God, but, you know, the other but, you know. She just, I don't know. She, you know, don't you say that, you know. And, you know, but she was just so loving. She was full of so much love. And for me, it was just so strange. That I had never met this woman and she immediately had so much love for me. And it was genuine. It wasn't fake. It was, she wasn't trying to love me. She sincerely loved me. And it just broke me down. I'll never forget the impact she had on my life. I mean, if you can imagine being uh, 18, 19 years old, 20 years old, meeting your grandmother for the first time. And, you know, at that time, this was the, you know, 
the mid to late 80s. I don't have much hair now, but uh, I used to be, you know, Billy Ray Cyrus, you know, mullet kind of guy, you know, listening to metal and, you know, I was pretty hardcore. I had a lot of drinking and drug problems. As a lot of young men do that end up growing up without a father. I was very hard. Been arrested, those kind of things. See, I waited to tell you this to the end, you know. But I had a really rough life growing up. And um, so I was a very hard person. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. The love of my grandmother. Like that. It, it was like a hot knife going through butter. And it just. I, I had no defense. I had a lot of defense for a lot of things in my life. I, I had walls up on all kinds of things. But there was no wall for love. And she loved me so much that it just broke me. And it was the love of God. That, not saying that she's God, but... When you know the love of God, you can give the love of God. There's no defense for love. There's no weapon that can form against love. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. God loves us so much. It's that love of God that leads us to repentance. And that's how all this matters to me. Because he didn't come for some agenda. He didn't come for an ulterior motive. He came because of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only and begotten son. Jesus loved us so much, he gladly, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That's how it matters to me. That's how it matters to you. The birth of Christ, in one word, is love. It's love. If you bow your heads, we're going to go ahead and close in prayer. As Mike and the team come up. Father, we thank you. Sincerely, Father, we thank you. For sending your son. Lord Jesus we thank you. For coming to earth. Defeating sin. Paving the way for us. For empowering us. For giving us life. And life more abundantly. For coming to set us free. Coming to heal us. Coming to give us victory. Most of all, for coming to show us what love really is. For it is your love, your goodness, your love that leads us to repentance. It's your love that breaks every chain. So, Father, we thank you for coming and touching the earth and showing the way. In Jesus' name. I think this drummer's awesome. Any, anytime I see a drummer take their shoes off, I'm like, uh-oh. This guy means business. Hey, I want to charge you uh, this morning. You know, there's a third time that God touches the earth. There will be a fourth time, but there's a third time. And that's when we accept him into our hearts. Because we're made of dirt. And you know that song said, I want to I wanna go, send me, you know, let me go out. Let me tell you something. When you have Christ in you, you are going out and touching the earth for him. He's doing it through you. Amen. I want to charge you and encourage you. Go be his hands and feet. Be, be the vessel that he can touch the earth again. Amen.
Amen. Let's just go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this charge. We thank you for the encouragement that, that we can go forth and be your hands and feet, that we can go forth and love our neighbor, show them the love, that, like you said, that they'll know us by the love we have for one another. God, that this love that you have, that it would grow in us because there's no defense for love. Father, I thank you for the charge that will go forth to be your hands and feet, that will go forth to spread the gospel, to share the gospel, to, to share the love of God to a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name, be blessed. Amen.